I'm Mark Katanchik. I'm uh, with Evolved Analytics. What I want to talk about today is, is the experiences in developing our software suite of products and uh, the lessons learned sort of historically along the way. Uh, uh, closing in on 20 years ago now, I started the Autonomous Analysis Initiative when I was at Dow Chemical. Basic notion was that large corporations, which I've painfully discovered, um, are great at collecting data, they're great at doing records retention, it's that conversion of data to something useful in that interim um, that, that's difficult. So the focus here, and, and so as a result, we really needed to improve that e the efficiency as well as the efficacy of developing insights from data. Um, focus is predictive analytics. I left Dow Chemical in 2005 to start Evolved Analytics, um, and that resulted in a mathematic package uh, data modeler. Uh, we've got a wide variety of application domains of clients around the world. So I, I sort of have to explain what, what we do. The basic notion is that we're going to use evolution to develop models from data. And what makes a good model is simplicity and accuracy, right? We want a good, simple model. We're going to reward those. And we're going to develop algebraic equations. So you know, human interpretable expressions. But furthermore, in this process, we're going to look at the, we're going to develop lots and lots of models. But we really want the ones at this location where it's the knee of the Pareto front, the, the best trade-off between complexity and accuracy. And we're still going to get hundreds or thousands of models there. And, and they're all good, they're all simple, they're all accurate. A uh, lot of benefits to this. Um, you can view this as a, essentially an automated hypothesis generator and refiner. So the implications that you have, so now I've got all these models, which are, which are all reasonably good from a deployment standpoint. Um, I, can, I can look at them and I can say, what variables are in here are most popular? What variable combinations? Uh, we can really get a lot of mining out of this, uh, this model set and maybe focus our analysis in on a handful of variables that are most usable from an operational standpoint. Um, and we're going to get take that, and, but so I've still got you know, all these models. Let's use those models. Let's select diverse set of these and, and build ensembles. And these ensembles are really neat because they will agree where they've been trained, where they've got presented data, because otherwise they wouldn't be good models. But we're, we'll choose them so that they're diverse. And so if they're asked to go into a, a new region of parameter space, then, those, then they'll diverge. Or if the underlying system has undergone some sort of change, they'll diverge. So, you know, so we've got this trustable model concept. Here's a uh, response plot explorer. The green dot's a known data point. And what you see is if I vary that dot, that data point, a variable away while keeping the others constant, my uncertainty blows out because I don't have data in that space. Um, so now I've got this sort of trustable model. The next thing I can do is go off and, and use that guidance of the trust to guide experiments because I can look for a spot in parameter space which is the most uncertain. And if I, can, if I can do this, that is the most valuable next experiment for me to run. Okay, so you have in two slides what in a training course I would cover for two days. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of nuances in behind the scenes. Um, <clears throat> and somebody, what happened? <laughs> and I got, okay, <laughs> people edited my slides. Um, okay, so in the beginning, we'll bounce around. Um, in the beginning was the package. I mean, this thing's a thing of beauty. Um, 460 functions extensive, you might even say anal, levels of documentation. Um, total control. If you're a control freak, you can build your own custom workflows. Um, you know, and the reality is nobody cared, right? So, um, 
So what, what, you know, what were the issues of that? And it's basically the users were coming from outside the Mathematica community. So they had to learn Mathematica in order to use the package. Uh, sh hitting shift enter is a remarkable barrier to people. I mean, I don't know why, but it is. And so as a result of it going out and the, you know, half my effort was training the people in how to use Mathematica so that they could use the package. And, and the users really didn't care about Mathematica as a foundation. They really wanted the power of the analysis. Um, the other problem in, in retrospect is that a Mathematica notebook, wonderful though it is for leaving an audit trail, is linear. And this, you know, the analysis and insight process is nonlinear. So, you know, what do we what do we do next? And if I, um, so, then there was the GUI. So we worked with Ariel Sepulveda here in, in the room, and and developed this beautiful interface, ease of use all over the yin yang using. Uh, you know, layering complexity with tool tips so that you know, your basic, your first view was gonna be something reasonably good, um, but you could get ex extra insight. Um, you know, we hammered the limits of what's possible and dynamic. This is a massive, a, a massive environment. Um, and, and really it was, it was, it was good because uh, the clients, you know, I mean, we're really responding. I mean, I'm getting almost no one at this stage of the game after this was developed who had a prior mathematics, Mathematica background. Um, let's see. All right. <laughs> okay, so, so now we have the package and, and GUI issues. Um, Basically, the issue is we're still tied. We're tied to Mathematica. It's built on top of Mathematica, um, so you need a you need a Mathematica license. Um, Wolfram's required to be engaged to demo the software because the 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 crippleware that comes out is the standard issue Mathematica demo can't write files can't can't do anything that allows some sort of usage. Uh, we also had the need for concurrent licenses becoming apparent. Um, yeah, you, you basically, um, you know, a corporate environment, and, I, and I, want a cor I want a concurrent license to be able to deploy people, because you know, if I'm selling into a General Motors or a Georgia Pacific or somebody like this, you know, I want them to be able to distribute widely and, and get a whole bunch of people a little bit pregnant. Um, so, uh, I had, uh, I guess a year ago, year and a half ago, I had four interns that I had assigned to this project. And, uh, and they came through, and, and basically there's two games in town, uh, Flexera and Reprise. Uh, both are sort of miserable. The interns did learn the value of both documentation and customer support in this exercise. Okay. Okay, so now I have to go back. Actually, this slide was, was in order fairly early. Um, so philosophy from the development standpoint is, to me, AI means augmented intelligence. Human has to be in the loop. Um, and a model that I'm gonna deploy in anger, I mean, that trust in that is established by both the use of the ensembles, these trustable models, and the context, the human context, in terms of selection of variables, selection of uh, you know meta variables that could be used in the development, and the other the other sort of yin and yang of the deal is that automation is good. I mean, because I, you know, I do not want to fight like you have to do in Mathematica with machine learning to make sure the data is purely numeric and and all this stuff. I mean, the machine should be able to handle this kind of stuff. Uh, missing data should you know, if I've got categorical data and I'm doing, you know, regression modeling, you know, I, sh I should be able to automatically convert that, and I should also be able to identify outliers and, and that sort of stuff. So, 
enter the app. Um, what we did is we went and got ourselves an enterprise mathematical license um, and packaged the GUI with CDF Player Pro essentially embedded within the package structure. So the installation process, at least on a, on a Mac, is you grab the icon on the, on the disk image, drag it over the applications folder, and, and boom, you're done. I, of course, I still have to supply you with the license key because I'd like to sell more than one license of this in the world. Um, you know, you have to go through the extra side of size of code signing with both Apple and DigiCert for the, the Linux and, and, uh, and Windows world. Um, you know, now you're, now you're having to do, rather than the package, which is, is generic Mathematica and Uniform, now I've got OS specific installers um, for the major operating systems. And it behaves mostly like a conventional app. And the really exciting thing is that people seem to care. So let's just go off and, um, and uh, see if I can get this thing to move to, okay. Um, just to show you the demo. Yeah, it's someplace here. Okay, so, so the, the opening splash screen shows up. I say open project. Um, you know, as you can see, it's it's sitting here on my dock, just like a, an app should sit. Um, I'll select, and I'm going to go to uh, my favorite demo sets. Choose, and uh, let's go for oh mushroom editability. Um, show machine lane name. So this is machine name. So it's the, the application is file driven. So, so you've got lots and lots of modeling going. I'll have multiple machines that you VNC into, and you want to see which one you're actually staring at at the moment, and they're all writing to a shared drive. Um, so I, I select a, uh, a target variable. So I got this mushroom that's edible or inedible. Um, this is a, a, a data summary table letting me look at, and it happens to be a, a purely categorical function, but in the normal mode for, for our client base is numeric prediction, but it, I think it's sort of fun to look at, to look at this. Um, and I can, I can sit here and I can take a, a snapshot, and I can go to my reports, and I can say, let's move it to the report. And now I've got, it, it moved it into the report, so I can leave an audit trail. Uh, the downside of the CDF player is at this point, I'm, I'm not allowed to type. In the, in, the, in the package version where you've got full Mathematica, I can edit and rearrange this notebook and, and do annotations, but at least I can save it and, um, and do good things along that line. Uh, analyze my models. Um, you know, so you see this is just sort of a standard issue. Um, app. Uh, now I can, I can come over here and I can look and I say, uh, what are, what's the dimensionality of my models? How many variables do I have required in my models? Um, and I've got in this particular case four or five variables. I'm layering the information um, to say how many should be included. I can focus in on which variable sets. That's not the, the focus here. Um, I will want to show you the notion of an ensemble. Um, So, I made my model summary table to look at, you know, basic statistics and, and things extracted out of the model. Um, come on, darling. Um, 
And you know, you, you, you layer the complexity. I can come in here with controls and sort of expand things. It's you know, very responsive from, a, a, you know, this is 100% you know, Mathematica, nothing, nothing extraneous out of the deal. Uh, if I look at my response plot explorer in this case, I'm going to be seeing, you know, I've got my data embedded um, for odor, which, I mean, if you can, uh, good enough. You can, uh, you can see I don't have any data with uh, odor um, there we go, with uh, a, a fishy smell to my, to my mushroom with those other things being held constant. So my uncertainty blows out. And I, you know, I probably don't want to, if I uncover a, a mushroom with all these attributes and it's, and it's supposed to be edible, but now I don't, you know, I don't know that I should go forward. Um, and I can sort of freely vary things. And if it's categorical, it, it will map to being a, a button rather than a slider. So just, you know, really a, a neat sort of application. So, and also, uh, you know, smart enough to know that if it's got categorical data, you know, don't connect the dots between the points. They really should be, they're, they're not covering that space. So, um, so we have this app and people are actually caring. Um, and, it's, and it's very exciting. You know, you still have some barriers. We still have the, the notion of most effective technology. Corporations, I mean, you get into organizations that if it can't be done with SaaS, it's not worth doing, right? Um, so we still have to, getting them to think different, getting them to certify the app and put it up on their software shelves is still a process. I mean, it's normal sort of barriers for corporate IT. Uh, I'm excited to hear about the, the rumored process, progress on XLSX import because that has been a real pain in the kibbutzka for years. Uh, having to tell people that, you know, convert it to a CSV file and then you can import. I mean, it's just not good. Um, this is a massive dynamic um, module. Uh, so there are dragons that, are, that live in dynamic. Um, we've, we've beaten on both, most of them. There are imposed limits on, on file sizes. Um, you probably don't want to go above a million records in the GUI version, whereas you're sort of not really limited in the, in the package where you're operating a notebook interface. Uh, you know, I think the record for data modeler is 26,000 variables, but you know, a couple, you know, a couple thousand inputs is, is probably reasonable. Um, the model search just basically looks and says, how many uh, cores do you have on your machine? We're going to launch independent searches with random starting points, random starting models, um, and just and grind away. Uh, and unfortunately, the kernels sometimes go rogue; they disappear. Doesn't really affect anything, but they still go rogue, which which is not what I like. And then for CDF, you know, leaving that audit trail, I'd really like to have the user be able to type in, not execute a notebook, but at least type into it an annotation. So, so acknowledgements. Um, first of all, Arial built the the GUI. Fantastic job. I mean, I've done a smidgen of GUIs and dynamics, and I'm going to happily pay Arial for that. Um, and he, his partner Aureliano, did the app conversion where we took the GUI and embedded the CDF player. Um, and, and build all the installers. Um, got it, do a shout out, and, and my, my wife asked me, why of all your beautiful birds that you photographed, you had you know, a roseate spoonbill, in which I think is the most beautiful, ugly bird in the world. Um, and I said, it was clearly shouting out, right? <laughs> um, so Andre and Wolfram were essential in getting this together. And then for the interface design, um, Teresa and Katya made it not look 
like a Mathematica GUI interface. I mean, the use of the color, the use of the layout, a lot of the focusing. Um, so that wraps me up. Uh, are there any questions?